Now, for those who don't know, I am a really, really big fan of the Naruto series, and I've watched every single movie repeatedly just to absorb more Naruto into my brain, because watching all 500 episodes of the anime is not going to do these days. So, yeah, I've been watching Naruto movies lately, and I thought about, hey, what would be my very first video talking about Naruto movie, and start with one of my favorites, at least from back then, Road to Ninja Naruto the movie. Now, Road to Ninja Naruto the movie is the ninth Naruto movie that has been released, as well as the sixth overall Naruto Shippuden movie that has been released in Japanese theaters in July 2012, and was later reached U.S. theaters in August 2014. Now, unlike the last, I did not see Road to Ninja when it first premiered. I saw the last when it first premiered, and that took a hell and a half to get to, get, to even get to that point. But Road to Ninja took a while, and it took me about think, 2013 till I watched it in Japanese in order to understand it. And that was back then when we didn't have subs, so I kind of had to watch the video, like the movie as is. It was leaked on YouTube. Thank freaking God for that, because there was no way I was able to get my hands on it back then. But anyway, at one point, Road to Ninja was actually the highest grossing Naruto movie until it was later beaten by the last Naruto movie, which will come afterwards. There was also an anime tie-in episode known as Road to Sakura, which involves the alternate version of Sakura coming to the original world, as well as a manga one-shot done by Masashi Kishimoto. Now, speaking of Masashi Kishimoto, Road to Ninja is the first Naruto movie that he actually did the character designs and the story for, and thank God for that. See, my main, my, I had a main gripe with the first, uh, with, with Naruto movies or some kind of anime movies, like in general, that aren't really done by the original creator. You see, like, the Naruto movies had, like, this thing where they had, like, these ugly ass villains and side characters. And, like, I, I know for a fact that Kishimoto had nothing to do with them. It, it happens in Bleach, too, but to a lesser scale, since Bleach has less, less movies. But, yeah, like, Naruto has some but ugly ass characters it, it was like the worst back in the first three naruto movies like good god but anyway i'm glad I'm, i know for a fact that kishimoto didn't do those characters but i'm glad they you know brought kishimoto on to do this movie now i think it was because of how popular this movie was that kishimoto also did the scripts for both the last which is actually canonical and boruto the movie which is actually canonical but now since the anime came out with in the manga came out with the whole new boruto material i don't know how the movie kind of ranks in that it feels like kind of like the whole dragon ball super movies like uh dragon ball super uh bow of gods and uh resurrection f it kind of feels like that's like where like you have the movies but now you have the anime versions which have more material and the manga versions have more material so i don't know how boruto works in this but eventually i'll get to that movie but anyway so the entire premise of the movie banked on the fans of wanting to see alternate versions of naruto characters and has a lot of fan service and i'm not meaning just the haha lewd fan service which that is also in the movie too but i mean like just the entire dna of the movie banks on fan service and callbacks and references and all that and i wanted to talk about if the movie could stand on its own as its own naruto movie or is it just a skeleton frankenstein of a bunch of other fan service or references to Nar or past naruto events that cobbled to get into this movie i wanted to talk about it because i, I actually like this movie and to a so somewhat extent it's not my favorite naruto movie hell no but i really wanted to talk about it and talk about if my thoughts will change after I'm done with this quote-unquote review. This is not really a review, it's more of a rambling thing, because I always have to do that. I, if, you, if you've seen the movie, please watch this video. If you haven't seen the movie, do not watch it, because everything I'm going to be saying only really works out if you have seen the movie. So, other than that, I will finally get on to this Naruto, Road to Ninja Naruto the movie little review kind of thing. As a side note here, when I'm talking about certain scenes in the movie, my pictures in the background is just pictures for the background. I just have images scrolling on the background, so whatever I'll say doesn't really correlate to the images in the background. I just want to warn you on that front because that happens to a lot of my videos and do get complaints about that, but this is not that kind of video. This is more of a rambling fan. It's why I like having images in the background so people wouldn't be looking at a still damn it, one, one single still image the entire video. I feel like that would be a little bit... It's hard to get people in those kinds of videos unless they know you really well. So, yeah, I just have pictures rolling in the background. So if you see pictures of scrolling past, just know that they're not correlating to the scenes I'm talking about at this moment. So the movie actually starts off with the Nine Tails and quote-unquote Madara. Now, we obviously know the whole deal about Madara being the fake Madara being Toby and yada yada. I'm only going to refer to him as Madara because this is a point in time where we didn't know that he was Obito. So... I'm just going to refer to him as quote unquote Madara the entire time so I won't be just stumbling my words because everyone else refers to him as Madara. He is Madara at this point in the anime. He's Madara. 
So anyway, it starts out with him and the Nine Tails destroying the Lee Village. It, I think this is a more most brutal. Actually, I can't say what's the most brutal one. It's like there's like less death in this one because it destroy. It shows the destruction of the village, but it's kind of just blowing away. You know buildings and debris and people are flying up in the air because of the destruction and the impacts and stuff like that so it's not anything brutal but i do like seeing people flying around so you know that's uh <laughs> that's so that's one thing i'm gonna give the movie people flying around but anyway it cuts later into the movie where naruto and the crew it cuts back to him to the Akatsuki, like the Akatsuki, you know the Akatsuki, the original main villains of part two not sorry part two naruto and it's weird that they're here because, you know, half of them, actually not even half of them, just the majority of them are dead at this point. I think the only ones that were left at this point were Kisame, uh, I think it was Kisame and Madara? I think it was at the point where there's just those two left, right? And uh, so Naruto and his crew, Naruto and yet a gang, uh, <laughs> the gang have to fight them back. Now, it's obviously revealed that they're fakes, but I just find it funny that no one even bothers to wonder, hot damn, these guys were capable of destroying many lives, destroying villages, causing massive damage and deaths to several people, and yet we're kicking their ass. It's also really funny as hell just seeing people like Shino and Kiba throwing hands with pain outside of video games. Hell, if you want to play one of the Ultimate Ninja Storm games, boom, you could just pick Kiba and Shino and beat the shit out of anyone. You could have Shino fight Kaguyo Tsuzuki if you wanted to, but to see it in actual movie form is funny as hell. Just seeing Kiba and Shino, like, like, there's a point in the movie where Pain is trying to get all the bugs that Shino's throwing them off and off, and then freaking uh, uh, Kiba just shoot, hits him with the, uh, God, what was the name of that movie? I just forgot the name of that movie. Uh, da, 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 da. The, the fang over fang there we go the fang over fang and it's just it's just funny as hell to see that though i won't lie it's kind of satisfying to see the whole game fight together even if it's kind of a fourth reason why the only time we really see like a whole group of naruto characters a fight one was during the war arc and i kind of like that i actually kind of like the idea of you know them fighting all together even though it's just a fake version of the akatsuki it's still fun enough to see and naruto rushing in to fight these fake akatsuki members the Naruto isn't the brightest tool in the shed. We know that. Everyone knows that. But seeing Naruto rush in to fight, you know, people like Pain just looks like it looks dumb on his part, especially after he has fought several members of the Akatsuki before. He had to kind of figure out what they were with beforehand, especially with Pain, because it took him time to get prepared to fight characters like Pain. They didn't know they were fake Akatsuki members. They all just gathered around to make sure that these weren't actual Akatsuki members. But even so, they didn't, Naruto didn't treat the situation as if it was the real Akatsuki, which I find kind of dumb on his part. Naruto isn't an idiot, but like, like he's not the smartest person, but he's not dumb either, you know? He, I feel like of all the things he would hold back to try to fight the Akatsuki members, like, oh, should I know this stuff? But, you know, whatever. So anyway, the crew, except Naruto and Sai, are meeting up with their parents. Uh, the parents praise them, and they're talking about joining applications to try to bring their children up from tuning to joining. Uh, Sakura complains about her parents embarrassing her. They're talking about kind of her dirty laundry and stuff like that. And her, Sakura's obviously not having that because they're just talking about that in front of everyone. Everyone's hearing this shit, and I, I clearly Sakura's embarrassed. Uh, so yeah, Naruto uh, doesn't have any parents. Durr, we know that. <laughs> Sai doesn't have any parents. Sai is you know, his whole way of getting to become a Joni is different because he's part of the foundation. So, you know, his whole thing is different. But, you know, Naruto doesn't have any parents. And, you know, it's kind of... It's, it, the movie is really about family. It starts off with Naruto and how lonely he is without his parents. Though this is at a point where, in the series where he has met uh, Miyato Kashina because this is, like, around... Like, this movie doesn't really fit in any kind of... in the canon timeline in some way because it's kind of weird because... It, it, it doesn't fit anywhere, you know? So the only closest thing I can actually bring up is the pain battle, even though this is still way after that. But the only thing I bring up right now is pain because they do talk about Minato and Kushina, and this is where a point where the, most of the members of the Akatsuki are dead at this point. So, you know, yeah. And even though this is where a point where Naruto has met Minato and Kushina, they still aren't around, they're still dead. And this is sad for the poor boy because, you know, he doesn't have any parents around him to actually, you know, having, you know, apparently, apparently, parental, damn, parental love around him, unlike everyone else. This movie makes you want to feel bad for Naruto from the get. 
It even shows him walking to the house to greet someone, though no one is there but his cold and empty home. Now, we've already been through the experience of, you know, the series drilling into the point where, drilling the point home where, yeah, Naruto's an orphan. He's a lonely boy. He has no one with him. I get that. And I kind of like the idea of the movie being around that because, you know, while we get that in the series, we don't get the, get like a bigger picture, like a motion picture. Um, but I feel like the, in a way the movie is kind of redundant about it. But honestly, the movie works together in some of those cases, but also kind of we go through this again. But I feel like this movie works together because it's not only focuses on just one character, it's focusing on two characters. And obviously I'll get to that when I go into further in the video. So Naruto meets up with Iruka at Ichiraku Ramen Shop. And he asks him about joining the application, but Iruka denies him. Iruka straight up says, look, dude, you're still a Genin. Even though you saved the world from pain, you kind of still need to rise up the ranks. Your dad rised up the ranks. He went from joining the Chunin. Sorry, he went from Genin to Chunin to Jonin to Hokage. He did all this shit. So you got to do it too, my God. So Naruto's kind of pissed off about it, you know. He's not he's not happy because a his parents aren't here, and b he kind of has to, he kind of turns it on Iruka. It's like hey, you know Iruka, your parents died too. So what do you gotta do about it? It's not like that, but he does bring up Iruka's dead parents, and that's, I feel like that was kind of uncalled for. I get it that where Naruto is trying to relate to Iruka because he has no parents as well, and I get that, but it, it, I don't know. I feel it feels kind of cruel, and then Naruto gets kind of he, he kind of lashes out at Iruka and. I get it, but if like it makes Naruto feel like a baby on his part, because normally he wouldn't be upset by this kind of thing, you know. But I, I guess the events of the movie would want to lead up to that. We need an excuse for why Naruto needs to be a sad boy, and they kind of have to do that because what else would there be? So and so while they're in Iriji Raku, Naruto gets triggered because he learns that once he gets his bowl of ramen, he learns that there isn't an, any Naruto maki or that Naruto fish cake stuff in his ramen. Instead, there is some ingredient called minma, aka dried bamboo shoots. Now, this whole minma thing comes into play later in the movie with a character I'll talk about eventually. Now, I get why Naruto is still pissy after talking to Iruka, but I feel like the whole being angry at the lack of Naruto Maki instead of Minma thing inside his ramen conversation kind of comes out of nowhere in a way to justify what happens later. It seems kind of dumb that Naruto would get pissy over this kind of thing, but it, I guess it makes sense. It's Naruto we're talking about here, but I feel like Naruto wouldn't care what kind of ramen it is, but... Eh, whatever it doesn't matter it doesn't matter it'll come to play later honestly i feel like this is one thing i can't forget because it's not really a major part of the movie it's like some kind of excuse to try to justify what happens later it's like hey this whole minma thing will come to play later somehow and i just... anyway sakura complains to her parents and she takes away like she has an argument with her parents in her house Nar uh, sakura runs out she takes away naruto to talk now, she talked about how her parents were controlling, how she doesn't get to live her life, how her parents constantly embarrass her. Now, at first, right when Naruto, um, Sakura starts talking, I could kind of understand why she was pissy. You know, I can understand her, you know, sometimes parents just get on your nerves, get in your way, you know, shit like that. You just want to relax and do your own thing. But Sakura, it, like, I, I, people like that meme on this scene a lot, but Sakura really. She just ruins all the sympathy I had for her at this point by telling Naruto this to his face. Why did it have to be you that's here with me right now? If Sasuke were here, he'd definitely understand how I feel. Now, Sakura's not really a favorable character among a lot of Naruto fans, but I believe that they really threw her under the bus with that line. There is no way in hell that they would make Sakura throw all her brains outside of the window just to say that line. Yes, sure, Sakura, the revenge-hungry orphan will understand how you feel. Like, good God. Like, I, I just don't know why. They even have to bring up that sign of Sakura saying that about Sasuke. There was no way that was warranted. Even the slightest minute way. There was no way that was warranted. I hate that line. It just makes Sakura look completely ungrateful. Like, I get the point of the movie was to show her that she should be grateful. But that line came out of nowhere and definitely did not need to be said. It was actually really, really bad. I hate that line. It's just a small line, but I hate it so much. And I'm going to move on from it before I just completely get pissed about it, honestly. 
So anyway, Madara, quote unquote Madara, arrives to trap Naruto and Sakura off in a Genjutsu world, though they just believe that they're they just, you know, back in their own world. They all they did was just, you know, all they thought they did was knock him away. The thing that weirds me out is that once Madara, sorry, Madara uh, takes them from the original world to the Genjutsu world, it's weird that even the crater Sakura left back into their world carried over to the Genjutsu world, which is odd. Now, Madara did explain that some things will be carried over, but the fact that she crossed the crater in one world that came over to the next seems a little bit weird I, I i don't know i'm just gonna move on from that one so sakura and naruto meet up with kiba akamaru shino and hinata who are a little bit weird to say the least akamaru doesn't like kiba she shino i'm gonna call him shiba like a dog shino hates bugs kiba likes cats and hinata is now more assertive dresses looser and is now possessive over naruto people including me, lost their collective shits when we saw uh, Road to Ninja Hinata. I know it's just one movie and we don't barely see her during the movie, but like, I mean, it's, it's Hinata in a different light, so God only knows. Like, I feel like that's the, I feel like out of all the characters in the entire movie, she made the biggest impact, and that's like, at least Kishimo knew what he was doing with Road to Ninja Hinata. And also, like, you know, after all that, like, even he not just starts to threaten, <laughs> threaten Sakura. It's like, oh shit, you get back, back off my man, or I'll kill your ass. And I just, I loved it. I just, she, she didn't say exactly that, but she did say she'll kill Sakura. If she was with Naruto, and I just, I, hearing Stephanie Shea talk like that through Hinata is just absolutely perfect. I love every moment of it. Now, at, so they, st okay, so, so Sakura and Naruto run away from them. Hinata chases them down, and there's this weird scene in the movie where Naruto and Sakura they were running. They're running away, and they run through an alleyway, and for some godforsaken reason, there, it's just like this three. It's like this short, stylized scene, which has no way being the way it is. I just got to show you guys because it's just that funny to me. <laughs> So they beat up with Choji, Shikamaru, and Ino. Shikamaru is now dumb. Choji is now skinny and doesn't like to eat much. And Ino, who is softer than she used to, she, she's like, like she's like Hinata, right? It's like if, as if Hinata and Ino swapped each other, except Ino's not really a yandere possessor, but you know, whatever. The point is, the point is, Ino's different. Everyone's different. So they come up to Naruto and Sakura. They have no idea about, uh, they don't know about Madara. They don't know who the hell Madara is. And Choji comes up to Sakura and say, "Hey, Sakura, you need to chill. You're the daughter of a of the Hokage. You kind of need to set an example." So Sakura's like, "What? What the hell are you talking about?" And Choji like, he points towards the Hokage rock, and it shows that Sakura's dad's there. So not only is that Sakura's dad is not the fourth Hokage, Sasuke, Sasuke Uchiha comes is actually now back in the village, and on top of that Naruto's name in this world is now Minma. See, I told you that that name would come into play later. Naruto's name Minma, but it's not over yet. There was more to explain about this whole Minma deal that will be explained by me. That doesn't really get explained by the movie all that much. So the gang heads off to the bathhouse, and now it's time to round out the other characters as the bathhouse. We meet Ten Ten here, the alternate version, uh, Road to Ninja World of Ten Ten, who is she is bad with weaponry. Uh, Neji is incredibly perverted to the point where he will even peep on his own cousin Hinata. Gross. And Rock Lee is later t revealed to be wearing women's clothes. So, honestly, I feel really disappointed about what they did with Rock Lee. Honestly, I feel like they were going to expect something more like dramatic, but all he does is really wear women's clothing. And I, I really feel that was a missed opportunity. I was like, man, like, everyone else is kind of like op pulling off opposite day. So, like... I, I, I don't know what Lee's supposed to be. Like, Lee, like, they already did the whole opposite day with Guy, which I'll talk about later in the movie, but it, 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 there's nothing to get with Lee unless they made him, like, like really charismatic. That would have been great because he's all, like, loud and boisterous and shit like that, but making him suave and smooth, I feel like that would have been a great opposite uh, Road to Ninja Lee instead of making him just wear ladies' clothes. I guess it was for a gag, but honestly, I feel like that was, like, really, really a missed opportunity. 
Also, there is this side note, which makes me laugh, and I feel really uncomfortable talking about it, but apparently Shino uh, has a huge, you know, thing, uh, thing in the road to Ninja... So, so here's the thing. So, like, in the Road to Sakura movie... Episode, I'm done. The Road to Sakura episode, they showed... Uh, the gang went off to the bathhouse, and Naruto peeked at Shino and saw that he, he had a huge thing. I'm not going to say the word because I feel very comfortable saying it. This is a Christian channel, even though I keep saying shit and damn and all the other curse words. Um, but anyway, um, so in the in he has that in the Road of Sakura episode, which leads up to this movie. But in the movie, the alternate universe, Shino has a small thing, which I thought was really funny. Because like Naruto, <laughs> Naruto piece like, oh, looks like you have a small opinion about things. I just, I just, I kind of lost my shit right there. That's, that's messed up. Uh so anyway, we come back to Sakura. So Sakura is uh, hanging out at her new place, well, her old place. It's just she doesn't have any parents anymore. So now knowing that she is parentless, Sakura now has the entire house to herself with no one to nag her. And you know, Sakura's taking us all in stride. She doesn't have to worry about her parents embarrassing her, complaining about her, uh, complaining to her anymore. So you know, she's just living a life. Though there is one thing that I thought that was funny. I can only imagine how the weird turn of events would have caused Sakura parents to die. I know that the events could have easily been different. They could have died in the they could have died in the line of duty. They could have got killed by the nine tails, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But I keep imagining it in the same exact way of how Minato Kushida died, and it makes no sense because obviously that would mean Sakura would be the nine tails Jinjuriki, <laughs> and then that would mean like that, that none of that makes sense because. You know, Kushina was special for a reason, being an Uzumaki and all, and able to hold back the uh, Nine Tails. So, I know that all the whole circumstances that would cause Sakura parents to die in the same way Naruto's did wouldn't have worked the same. But every time I think about it, it keeps coming up as the same way, and I can't, I can't stop laughing about it because it's so out of place and wrong. And it's like, it's like they're doing the same scene of Nianto Kushina dying like along with uh, Naruto. And I keep imagining Naruto, uh, uh, Sakura's parents' faces being phased over Nianto Kushina's and baby Naruto being replaced with like a baby Sakura or some shit that can't stop laughing about it. It's so dumb. But anyway, Naruto's place, his own home, has someone else in it. And now since he was technically homeless for the night, he sleeps on a park bench. Elsewhere, quote unquote, Madara apparently has had the Akatsuki clones, which were actually white Zetsus, transform into the Akatsuki. So it, it, it works as if he apparently sinned. Remember, he, he had. Hold on, how to explain? He had white Zetsu clones, right? Already made in the Genjutsu world. They transformed into the Akatsuki. He sends them into the original world. Then they do the they you know fight the group and then they get sent back to the Genjutsu world. It's like a test run, right? Speaking of test run, uh, the Genjutsu world that Madara brought him into, also known as the Limited Sukuyomi, is an experimental test run for the Infinite Sukuyomi that will come later in the play in the series, and is designed to be a mirror that traps people within this world. Though Zetsu makes a note that this isn't completely similar to the distortions. Now, all characters are completely different personality-wise. This, this is an excuse to explain why they're different like personality-wise because of distortions. Uh, Madara does explain that, hey, look, a little ripple can, like, anything, a little ripple can cause anything change it. I guess he meant that if he, I think that what he meant is that because he sent Naruto and Sakura to the world, they're the disturbed the ripple that causes distortion. That's why everyone else is different. That's, that's, that's my explanation. The movie doesn't explanation. He just says distortions. <laughs> But anyway, we're also introduced to a mysterious masked man who is approached by quote unquote Madara and he offers him his power. So later on this, uh, ep uh, I keep saying episode, this is not an episode, it's a movie, damn. Later on in the movie, Sakura is later approached by Sasuke who offers her a rose and Sakura is just over the moon as Sasuke is showing any kind of affection towards her. So Sasuke we're talking about. So, you know, any anything from Sasuke that Sakura could get, she'll take it. Also, we meet Sai around this time, and Sai is known to be a terrible artist because he was a really great artist, and now I wonder how he even does his Super Beast scrolls knowing that he's a shitty artist. Like, do you have to be a good artist to do the Super Beast scrolls? Like, what if you're a shitty artist? Can you still manifest the creatures? Like, the monsters, like the monsters and shit? Like, can you still do that? I, I will forever think about this. <laughs> 
But anyway, Sakura is super popular around the village because she's now, you know, she's a child of heroes. They don't explain his father, but they don't really explain much about the mother, like Sakura's mom. So I guess she's really irrelevant. See, here's what gets me right. I feel like, I feel like they say heroes, but they don't say nothing about Sakura's mom. We know Sakura, Sakura's dad was on the Hokage Rock, but we don't get much from him in this movie other than being jokey. We get more from Sakura's mom in this movie. I feel like it wouldn't be any different if Sakura's mom was the Hokage instead of her dad. I feel like it being her mom would make a lot more sense, but hell, I don't know. I didn't make this movie. Kishimoto made this movie, and I didn't make it. So we also meet Road to Ninja versions of Tsunade and uh, Shizune. So Tsunade is now flat, which is just the whole... It's so funny that the one of Tsunade's main traits was her chest, and they made her flat because this is an alternate Tsunade. And I just find that hilarious. Because, like, where everyone else, a bit of their personality, you know, their main personality traits were things that were swapped and taken away, right? So seeing Tsunade's chest being just completely deleted and given her glasses. Okay, the glasses I don't get. I don't get the glasses. It, it kind of implies that Tsunade was dumb, but Tsunade's not dumb. She's like one of the best medical ninja on the planet. So, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what the point of glasses. I guess, I guess they gave her the glasses to make her look like different enough because just taking her chest away wouldn't have been any different. So I guess that giving her the glasses would at least make her look different. I don't know. You could have gave her like a... Uh, I don't know, like, 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 you know how she has like two those head, like head ponytail things. You could have gave her one. You could have her have long hair. I don't know. Anyway, uh, they also got Shizune, who is now busty. So I guess that Shizune took Tsunade's chest, which I just forever find hilarious because I actually like Shizune. So seeing her like this, it just makes me completely just laugh. <laughs> Blessy Shizune, god damn it. Anyway, also her pig Tauntaun is black now. They had to change Tauntaun too. They had to change the pig too. Oh my god. <laughs> but anyway, so we all, so in this world, uh, Tsunai explains that Jiraiya is still dead in this world, right? He passed away trying to obtain something known as the Red Moon Scroll, which will be important in the later events in the movie kind of it's kind of ambiguous about how much this how strong like it's not really ambiguous because they tell you what this um scroll will be for uh but i will tell you later but i just i don't know <laughs> i don't know honestly it, it comes into play later but it's not in the way that you'd expect something like this would be important they talk about it's like a prophecy and shit like that so soon i have to keep the uh scroll under wrath because you know they don't want nobody to get into it because it will ruin the prophecy uh, the moon has to kind of be stained red in order the prophecy to be fulfilled, so... ye. So, Naruto gets the bombshell that uh, Miyato and Kushina are revealed to be alive in this world, because, hell, so Miyato didn't die that night. Kushina didn't die that night to attack the Ninetales. So, of course, they'd still be alive. Yay! And uh, Kushina just immediately jumps in and punches Naruto. I don't like Kushina in this movie. I don't like her. She kind of kills the whole motherly thing that OG dead Kushina had. You know, she had like this more of like a, hey, like this upbeat motherly type character to her, but she was also not willing to take shit. This Kushina just doesn't willing to take shit. And she like, I, I don't know, man. I, I don't like this Kushina. I don't like how she was portrayed in this movie, or at least this version of Kushina. She comes off in, as an abusive mother, which funny enough will tie into a point I have later in the movie. And hopefully I remember it by the time I get to that point because I really have to talk about it. <laughs> but anyway, I'll bring this up later when I talk about another character. Uh, plus, she just straight up sucks as a ninja. We finally see her go out as a ninja and she just sucks. <laughs> she gets hit by a poison attack on her foot and this it KOs her immediately. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, alternate universe Kakashi is more upbeat. They go on a mission with Kakashi and Guy. Uh, and... Alternate Universe Kakashi is more a beat, while Guy is drained and out of youth. So, a total role reversal, as Sakura puts it, you know, Kakashi drained up all his power. <laughs> Kakashi stole all of uh, Guy's power of youth shit. And it kind of implies that Kakashi is just down and out. Like, you just, like, they kind of they mess it up where, like, Guy is, like, now, like, this dude who's like, dude, I'm so my life is behind me and I'm so tired. But I find it funny that Kakashi never really acts that way unless he's want to be lazy about something. But like this guy is like completely drained. 
Sam Regal, like the voice actor for Kakashi, he also killed me at this point because Mito asked Kakashi to point out, uh, he uh, scout out the site for the with his Sharingan, and Kakashi speaks in this way that makes me laugh because he can't do it. Sensei laid some traps to keep it safe. Kakashi, take the lead and look ahead for us with your Sharingan. Understood. Or so I'd like to say, but uh, went a bit overboard. I've been using the Sharingan a lot. So anyway, now that uh, Minato, Kushina, Guy, Kakashi, Naruto, and Sakura, they made over to the site where they're supposed to retrieve the Red Broom Scroll. Jiraiya had placed traps in order to hide the scroll back, which involves a lot of frogs. Like, a lot of them. There's like so many frogs, including Gamabunta and all the other frog crew. I've got the other frogs' names, but don't, like, don't, like... Don't add me on it, because I remember Gamabunta, and that's like the only one I remember, and Gamakichi, and he's not even here, so... Pfft. Anyway, um, after a bunch of wacky shenanigans, Minato eventually obtains the Red Moon Scroll, and as I mentioned before, the scroll can only be used when the moon is stained vermilion red, so at the time, they can't make a move, and meanwhile, Tsunade decides to lock up the scroll inside of a safe in order to use it for late when the time comes. So around that time, uh, Naruto gets to go home. He gets to hang out with his parents. Sakura doesn't have any parents to hang out with, so she gets to just go back to her own lonely house, which she always wanted to be at. Naruto's even dead ass leaving Sakura alone just to be spending time with his parents. And I just I just find that hilarious. Sakura doesn't have any parents, and I just find kind of find kind of cathartic that she's kind of suffering. It, it, it sounds cruel, and I don't even hate Sakura as much as other people do because I kind of don't see her that way. But yeah, I just find it hilarious. So, the, this masked man now, and uh, Madara's been hanging out with him now, and so they decide to make their move. Uh, it cuts to Sakura, now in dealing with the dark, crippling loneliness, and now she starts to feel Naruto, it's just a feel if Naruto ever felt that way. She starts to say, did Naruto ever felt this way? You know, damn, Naruto, you really felt this way? Damn, it sucks. <laughs> now she sees uh, people hanging out. She goes out to try to, you know, just do something. She sees people hanging out. You know, like Naruto Daryl in the movie where like uh, kids were spending time with their parents and shit like that. So now Sakura's going through the same thing. She sees Sasuke amongst the crowd and then he she she sees Sasuke and he's like near a bunch of other women. And so Sasuke revealed to be a playboy. He kind of does the same hand your rose and say sweet nothings into your ear like he did to the Sakura. And so Sakura kind of runs off crushed because now Sasuke was the last per like honestly soccer is already sad and shit so seeing the sasuke thing is like icing on the cake like it, I, I just find it hilarious so soccer now not wanting to deal with this world she runs off to go see naruto but now now naruto is really happy with his parents and sakura now remains a parentless lonely goober <laughs> lonely goober sakura haruna but anyway the masked man uh he rides to the village he wrecks the hokage's office um, and then he summons these creatures known as the Nine Mass Vaha or the Nine Mass Beasts, which I actually kind of like. I actually kind of like the Nine Mass Beast concept because not only each beast is different, he gets to summon nine of them and they're all cool as shit. And I wish that actually made it to the main series. Honestly, Naruto would have never be able to use this kind of power, but damn, this would have been sick. Anyway, uh, Mass Man isn't too fond of Naruto. He tells the boy that he feels something repulsive within Naruto, obviously referring to the chakra of Kurama. And he sorry, it's like, you know what? F it, fine. You guys won't give me this scroll. I'm just going to destroy everything. So he he floats up to the air and he performs a jutsu known as the Great Rasen Rengu. It's basically like this condensed evil form of like the Rasen Shuriken. And he drops the the Great Rasen Rengu down, destroys the entire village, just the same way Pain did with the Almighty Push. Which, honestly, yeah, I, I told you this movie was chock full of fan service. And this one was just unnecessarily fan service. They didn't have to do that. But. It's a nice callback to Pain, even though they really didn't have to destroy the village twice. Even though this is an alternate universe version of the village, but I, I whatever. Anyway, funny enough, we don't see any other alternate universe like, versions of Naruto's friends at this point. And I can only assume that they're dead now. The village killed them all. Like, you remember, mostly everyone died, like, during, like, uh, the Pain, uh, Pain Assault. Well, I can only assume that characters like Hinata, Shino, Kiba, Shino, Kiba, you know, all of them, they're all dead. They're all dead. Masked Man killed them all. <laughs> so Naruto decides, is like, you know what, I'm going to have a big emotional speech with my parents. I'm going to go off and fight Minma after telling the fake uh, Minato and Kushina about them from his world. He talks about, you know, how 
the Minotaur Kashina from their world, how they, you know, a great sacrifice they made, how the things they told Naruto when he was a baby, you know, all that stuff. And that was really emotional. I like that. He was like telling us like, hey, look, you guys are not my real parents. My real parents were OG. <laughs> That's what he's essentially saying. And so here's what gets me, right? He has the fourth Hokage Haori, or how do you pronounce that? I'm going to call it cloak because it's easier to say. Uh, the fourth Hokage cloak that earlier in the movie, Sakura had in her claws because obviously her dad was the fourth Hokage in this universe. And she had the fourth Hokage cloak in her closet. So here's what gets me. In this universe, somehow, the cloak survived the explosion that Minma caused. It somehow came all the way from Sakura's closet, unscathed all the way to where Naruto was, and he conveniently put it on. Again, more fan service, because people would definitely want to see Naruto wearing a Hokage outfit. And this is the first time we get it. It's not canonical, but we still got it. And I, I just feel like that was really pushing it. Somehow, this clothing made it survive, not only survive the village destruction, which killed people, but also somehow made away from a random, like some, somehow made away from Sakura's closet, which, whatever. Again, whatever. Sometimes, like this movie expects you to kind of throw away logic just to see the cool shit happening. That's what the movie is kind of all about. And it, it it's kind of depressing, it's really, because. Naruto is a series known for ex over explaining shit so having this just let it go just to have cool ideas eh, I don't know whatever it, it just looks cool in it, so I don't care so the masked man and Naruto begin to duke it out and he summoned his nine masked beasts yet again but Naruto is saved by an unlikely group the goddamn Akatsuki of this world who are actually mercenaries like in this world, they're actually mercenaries, and they have been hired by Tsunade to help out. It isn't known when they've been hired to help Tsunade, because I don't know how Tsunade would have helped them out. Like, whoever, how she would have able to call them in this time of crisis, but, you know, whatever. She did it, and the Akatsuki are now helping out Naruto, which is actually really hilarious to see. So, upon defeating the Nine Masked Beasts, they turn into small foxes, which will be important later, some way. So... After the masked man and Naruto clash, they clash Naruto's Rasen Shuriken with his great Rasen Ringu, which I find it funny that the great like it's not like how Pain's uh, All Might push worked, because like they had to have that interval of like time between where he had to either use uh, the All Might push like the Shira Tensei or the Banshio Tenny, like it was a time interval, but. Minmo was just able to just to drop the Rasen Ringu and destroy the entire village with, like, no drawback. So the fact that Naruto was able to clash with it with equal power just seems kind of unlikely. But, again, I'm going to be saying whatever a lot because I've already said this movie a lot, but whatever once again. So anyway, upon their clash, it's revealed that Minma is actually Minma Uzumaki in the alternate universe world of Naruto. And that's where I said that the whole Minma thing and earlier in the movie would come to play. There's this dude named Minma. He's the alternate universe version of Naruto here. So, there's a couple of questions that get raised up, right? Now, using Ro... Okay, first of all, this is my first question. Where is alternate Sakura, right? Now, we know that she's in the original world while all this movie is taking place because as of Ro Sakura, the alternate universe world of Sakura is over in the original world. So, they kind of swap places. So, I get that. So, I don't need an explanation on that because that's, that's where I know where alternate Sakura is. But... A, the Minma Uzumaki reveal wasn't really hidden too well because in both the English and Japanese versions, it was pretty obvious. In the Japanese version, I can kind of accept it, but in the English version, they just took the English uh, voice actress and voice and just dubbed, uh, dulled it down and covered it with a mask. So, yeah, it, it really didn't hide it well. And it just raises more questions like, why did Minma become evil? How did Minma become evil? Where Minato and Kashina were aware of him being evil. Like in the beginning of the movie, it's apparently said that he's going after the tailed beast because he's like he's like apparently the solo Akatsuki of this universe. Because the Akatsuki are actually mercenaries. Minma would technically be like the solo Akatsuki. Like he's just a dude doing all this evil shit on his own, right? Until he was approached by Madara and made him do other shit. So one thing I don't get is that there's, there's a bunch of things that he does that makes no sense. But I remember I talked about the whole Kashina thing earlier, how she was like an abusive parent. That was my head canon, is that she was so abusive that freaking Minma ran away from home and turned to an evil guy. Because they definitely weren't aware that Minma had turned evil. So I can only imagine that this is what 
freaking Madara meant by distortions. Like, hey, they went to this world, now this Minma is evil. Because Kushida and Minato weren't aware that Minma was now this evil criminal bad guy. Because he was a criminal. He had a record and everything. But they didn't know. They just figured that Naruto was still their child. So, like, I don't, I don't, I don't freaking know. You tell me. There's a bunch of other questions that get raised from it either. Like, I'm just like, why would you... Like, obviously, obviously, I already know that this Minma is evil just for the sake of having an excuse to have a clash between Naruto and an evil Naruto. But at the same time, like, okay, he's evil. Like, he's like the final boss of the movie. Okay. But anyway, as I was said before about the Nine Masked Foxes, they all go to Minma and allow him to summon his own version of Kurama to the outside world. Like, he's actually able to sit on Kurama and fight alongside him. Just like how Naruto was able to do back in, like, part one, where he was able to transform Gamabunta into, like, a form, like, like a, like a image of, um, an image of Kurama in order to fight back, uh, Gara and Shikaku. So that's kind of cool. Um... So Naruto decides to make a deal with Kurama, and he also summons Kurama to the outside world. So now we can have a Naruto slash Kurama versus Minma slash uh, Black Kurama showdown. The whole it's like the whole enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of deal. Now the fight isn't too spectacular, really. It's just standard Naruto fare. Honestly, I think that's what one thing I find kind of disappointing about the movie. The animation is decent, but it's not like anything special like the other movies were. Like the other movies, like I, I, I think I could particularly bring the movie of um, uh, the Guardian movie or whatever the hell, like the Crescent Moon Kingdom movie, right? The third Naruto, the, the third Naruto movie. That movie had impressive animation. I get some of these animation studios are different, or whoever's working on this movie is different. They didn't have the budget this time around, but honestly, I feel like. This has, like, the kind of the weaker animation of the Naruto movies. Like, honestly, it's not anything special. There's nothing wrong with the animation. There's, like, no errors or big anything gross about it. But it's kind of really... Like, it's like it could pass for an episode of Naruto and no one would really notice. Like, if this was broken up into its own arc, it could pass off for an episode of the anime and no one would even know. Hell, the freaking Shikara arc has better animation than this. What I find is crazy. But anyways, it's normal. It's just not bad animation. It's normal. So that's a good thing. So, after Naruto beats Minma, Madara pops up, and he absorbs himself into Minma. He uses Minma's body to fight back Naruto, and also Minma now has the Sharingan, so yeah, let's chalk that up to the, the higher up on the fan server scale. An evil version of Naruto now wielding the Sharingan. If that is the most fanfic bullshit anyone has ever heard, I swear to God, I, it's fanfic -y bullshit, but God, I love it. <laughs> it, it just like, I, I love it. But anyway, also, let's give Naruto a round of applause for trying to open the Red Moon Scroll right in front of an attacking opponent, leading Nar uh, Madara to break it in half. I get that it had to wait till then for the moon to turn red in order to use the Red Moon Scroll. But at the same time, Naruto tried to open it and activate it while Minma was attacking him, and it got broken half. And the thing that gets me right is that the Red Moon Scroll didn't have a purpose. After it got broken in half, that was it. Hell, around that time, Madara apparently knows how to wipe memories now, and he wiped Naruto's memory. So Sakura actually comes in clutch, and it's so funny seeing Sakura come in clutch. She actually came in and helped Naruto a couple times against Minma, which is actually pretty cool. Like Sakura's actually doing something which is crazy now again i don't consider uh, sakura's useless like everyone else in the naruto fandom does she has her moments and i don't think she's not much of a combative type because healings are her main thing in hell without sakura naruto and sakura would have died at one point in the war but as i was saying before sakura actually came in clutch a couple of times in the movie which is actually really refreshing because you know she doesn't get to do anything in these movies you know, Sakura rarely gets to do anything of significance in this movie. So, considering the movie is, like, based around her, too, it's actually really nice. I like that. You know, I give Sakura props for actually trying to help Naruto out. And, again, as I mentioned before, I don't know how Madara's able to wipe memories, but hell, Naruto forgets his memories for, like, a couple of seconds. And then he sees, like, the like the circle parts of the scroll, and then he remembers the Rasengan, what, you know, uh, what Jiraiya taught him and everything like that, which I guess was a nice callback to Jiraiya, even though it really doesn't matter all that much. But, I mean, hell... I, I don't know. I don't know. They didn't really have a purpose for the scroll. Honestly, if I'm forgetting something, I'm sorry. I'll probably have to look it up later. But honestly, like right now, I can't because I'm doing this video. But I've watched this entire movie and I remember watching it before and I still have no idea what the purpose of the scroll was. I mean, it, it didn't serve a purpose. Honestly, Madara broke it. The end. <laughs> but anyway, Naruto beats Minma slash Madara in a fashion similar to the way Minato did it. Minato... 
I guess you guys already know that Manta threw his um, flying Raijin, flying Raijin kunai. He throws at Mara. Mara, sorry, well, sorry, Toby, Obido, whatever. Obido uses his Kamui. The the uh, the kunai goes right through his head, and then Mara, uh, Minato is able to teleport above Obido because his kunai is above him. Teleport there and you know slam it down with the Rasengan. Naruto in this situation kind of does. He just hops over. <laughs> Mieto and sorry, Ma, sorry. Let me let me do it. I'm, I'm, my brain's messed up. So Naruto kind of jumps over Mima slash Madara and just slams the Rasengan down on. Which I mean, it's not as cool as Mieto did it, but again, more fan service for you people. So around the end of the movie, Minma reverts back to his original looking self. Like he he looks like Naruto at the end of the movie after he's been beaten. And it kind of implies that he may have the black hair and evil influence due to Madara's act, well, Madara's actions. Because after Madara pieces out, he goes back to looking normal again. So it isn't explained. That's the only implication I could bring up because I have no freaking idea how to explain it. So, yeah. So it gets around to the end of the movie. Naruto, Sakura return back to the original world. Everything is all good again. Sakura learned to appreciate her parents more, and Naruto was able to joy and make peace with his parents. He kinda, he made peace with his fake parents, but still, it was more of you know him talking, getting a chance to talk to his quote unquote real parents in a way. And plus, Naruto gets to enjoy cake with Ruka, who he does consider a dad, which is nice. And that's around the end of the movie. Honestly, the last sorry, the last Naruto movie was a movie I really liked, right? And when I thought of watching it, I thought about, okay, what about the movies that took prior, like Road to Ninja, right? So I thought about it, and I was wondering, okay, what does Road to Ninja have that stands on its own, right? What does it, what could it say that keeps it from not being like, like, like I feel like Road to Ninja is like the more outlandish Naruto movie because of all the alternate universe characters. So I think that's what set it set it set itself apart from the other Naruto movies. See, all other Naruto movies kind of follow a basic principle. The characters go to some mission, they do something, they kind of solve it. Blood Prison was also another cool thing where they kind of like, you know, Naruto's in prison now, even though the, the reason I got there was kind of, you know, stretched a little bit too thin. But with World of Ninja, a lot of, you have to kind of suspend your belief in a bunch of things. This is Naruto, so like, you know, you it's kind of like hard to say like this movie gets a pass because like a lot of things just kind of happen you know a lot of things just kind of happen if this movie was made for the sole fact of capitalizing on the fan service and the references and all that shit and there's nothing wrong with that you know some movies kind of need that edge to push them further but i think that's what all road to ninja is right i feel like if road to ninja had a concept hey there's an evil naruto running around i feel like that still wouldn't have been enough right and it it's weird, but also I like the idea of Naruto getting to meet his parents and spending time with them before, you know, you know, a, a, a opportunity to spend time with them when he never could in the original series. And it also gives Sakura more of a role than she's ever had in any other Naruto movie because it gives her a chance to see things from her point of view. We get to see how she would feel like without any parents and how she would be like in Naruto's shoes. And I kind of like that. I feel like this movie did more good for Sakura than it did for Naruto because we, we've we had the home, we have it hammered into the ground that we know that so Naruto doesn't have any parents. And while I believe that Sakura's parents being embarrassing was the main reason she wouldn't want them around, I feel like if they played it up more with Sakura, like a little bit more, show her like, man, she sees, maybe if she saw like visions of her parents being in the household and they fade away because like, she knows they're not there, I feel like that would have been a little bit more. But as for this movie, I have no idea what to think about. It's a very mixed movie to me, even to this day. I can't say I hate the movie because there's some points in the movie I really do like, but honestly, it's not really a movie I could just say, hey, this is one of my favorite Naruto movies. Back then it was. But then the more I think about it, the more I think is, you know, what is there to the movie that I can latch onto and still remember, other than, you know, the, the alternate version of the characters. We don't get really anyone new in this movie, actually. They're all characters that we know, and I think that's either a good thing or a bad thing, uh, depending on who you ask. Some people like, you know, some people like Naruto original characters, uh, the original movie characters. Some people don't like the original movie characters. Um... 
And I won't lie, some of the original movie characters are a hit and a miss. You know, for example, characters like Tonari Otsutsuki, he's a definitely hit and a miss in the last Naruto movie because people don't know what to think about him to this day because, you know, he brought up a whole new power source. Hey, the Tensei gun, woohoo. But we don't really get much of him other than him being kind of like a stalker ish for, you know, Hinata. So I feel like. On one hand, introducing a bunch of new, quote-unquote, new characters to this movie would have been a bad idea. Because, like, I don't know who else could have been new for this movie. I mean, even with the alternate version of the characters, there's still characters that we know of, that we seen before. They're just different. Even with Minma, he's still Naruto, but evil. And I don't know, man. I just kind of... I don't know. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. This movie's a weird, I don't know kind of movie. There are some things that I believe that could have been better. Uh, the action could have been better. I feel like there the things that felt like they were wasting my like the, like the Jiraiya whole frog thing would sound like something he would do, but I, I just I don't know that part of the movie was kind of wasted. I don't know. Again, there's some things they kind of use an excuse for. Like if they if they had some info about Minma and how he became the way he is different story but i guess it's because you can chalk this up to being a genjutsu world where like it's just a test run for the infinite Tsukuyomi. these characters are not characters we supposed to actually give a damn about that's great but again this is a movie and i feel like i should supposed to latch myself into one character and i feel like the only character that oh actually only two characters actually well let's say four five characters that i actually really liked how they done with this movie was kakashi who was really funny Naruto, who they emphasize him being with his parents. Sakura, who they emphasize without being parents. Uh, Hinata, who was actually really funny. And e and um, Eno, who was actually pretty sweet to see. I actually liked Alternate Universe Eno. But yeah, that's uh, Road to Ninja Naruto the movie. It was a decent movie. It, it was, it was, I, I ain't gonna say it's mediocre, because I feel like that'd be insulting, but it was okay. It wasn't the greatest Naruto movie, but it wasn't the best. Like, I remember back in the day where I thought it was, like, the best movie ever. Like, man, this Naruto movie is the best. It's getting a lot of money. Holy crap. Like, but then when I think about it more, I'm like, eh, it's, it's eh, it's, it's okay. It's not the best Naruto movie. But, yeah, I'm, a, I'm done with this video before I stretch it on any further. After. I will see you all next time. Peace out, everyone. I gotta go. Hopefully, I get to talk about more Naruto movies next time.